For those of you who are uh, here for the first time, thank you so much for the new joiners. And for those of you who've been following us for a little while now, thank you for helping us build this amazing community that is uh, really starting to grow here around the Percussion Conservatory. And uh, we already have 16 people who have, who have come into this, uh, to this webinar today, and we have many more on the way. It's, it's growing by the second here, um, surpassing 20. And, uh, and we had about 50 people registered for this webinar. So it really means the world to me that this community is starting to grow, that you guys are finding value out of this, that you guys want to be here, and that you feel like what we're doing is, is useful to you for your musicianship, for your artistry, and your percussion playing. Um, the goal of the conservatory is to bring to the world, to everyone who wants to see it, world-class percussion playing. Um, and what I mean by world-class is, you know, all, all of the artists who are, who are a part of the Percussion Conservatory either have a, a major position with an orchestra or they teach at a major university or they just make amazing digital content that really caught our eye. And, um, and, they're, and they're all people that I, I know personally and have gotten to know better uh, through this project and through this company. And everyone is really dedicated and committed to uh, you know, advancing percussion education, to, to make percussion education something that's truly accessible for everyone, no matter where you live or, or you know, what access you've had to education in the past. Here you go, here's some quality information for everyone. So I really did my best to put in everything I could into this class, and I, I hope you get some value out of it. And I'm one to be very punctual, so I want to go ahead and start the class on time for everyone who got here on time. I really appreciate punctuality, so thank you for being here. And this is De La Clus 9, a comprehensive guide. So what are we going to do today with De La Clus 9? What does that mean, a comprehensive guide? If you read the little description, you noticed that there were a number of things I talked about, some vocalization techniques, rhythmic integrity, dynamics, um, you know, consistency of roles in these things, and also how to choose some stickings. So really for, for De La Clouse 9 specifically, because this etude shows up so often on auditions and in general in our repertoire, just it's asked for very often. Um, it's important that you have a, a really consistent game plan going into it. So a lot of what I wanna focus on today is what I would call how to give a successful performance of this piece. So not necessarily the most musical <laughs> interpretation ever, or the most risky interpretation, or the most innovative interpretation, but I wanna give what I would like to think is a successful performance. So I wanna define that really quick, that a successful performance of this piece is one where you clearly conveyed your musical ideas to the listener, and the listener was then able to process those ideas and say to themselves, wow, that percussionist really knows what they're doing, right? So that, that person sounds qualified. That person sounds like they put a lot of effort into this. I would feel comfortable having that person be a part of my program or a part of my orchestra, whatever it may be. And the reason I wanted to talk about this etude is because it's one that I personally have had a lot of success with. I've played this etude for a lot of orchestra auditions where I have advanced past the rounds, and I've also used it on almost every single audition for schools, for conservatories, including Juilliard and New England Conservatory and Rice University and uh, Manhattan School of Music. So it's uh, many different people have heard this performance of this piece and thought that it was at least okay, at least good enough to get to the next step, right? And so that's what I want to focus on today. How do we get De La Clouse 9 and these De La Clouse etudes in general, your snare drum playing in general, how do we get this to a place where you're consistently going to be asked to the next round or invited to the first level of the program, okay? So the very first thing we do when we're trying to create a consistent performance, for me, one of the very first things I have to do is I scan the whole piece and I make sure that I've chosen the right tempo because the first time I'm going through the piece, I need my stickings to actually be at the right tempo. Because if you practice very slow, which we often do when we're learning something, our sticking might be very different for something slow than it is for something fast, okay? So 
when I start this piece, and I'm going to be going through measure by measure, and I'm, I'll probably do a performance at the end. Um, a little cold in here. I'm going to turn off my AC. Um, what I like to do is um, I like to go through these pieces measure by measure and really make sure that every measure has been accounted for. So starting with the very first measure, we just have a, a very, very simple pattern. But we need to decide how we're going to play it. We need to decide, da 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 dum blah, okay? How, do we, how are we going to go through this and what tempo do we choose? So what I have found for 30 second notes in this piece is that if they're too quick, if they're actually, if you play them at the tempo that's marked on the page, when you play this in a big hall, it will sound too fast. People will have a very difficult time feeling the rhythm with you, feeling the clarity of, the, of all the uh, 30 second notes. So it's important for me to a little bit try to disregard the tempo that's on the page and play the tempo that I feel like, again, is going to be the most successful. So sometimes, depending on how much reverb there is in the hall, that can bring me all the way down to dotted quarter note equals 57. I think that's about the slowest I go, but it is necessary to be able to play at that tempo if you're in a very, very reverberant space where there's a, a lot of excess noise and you're getting a lot of slap back from the hall. Um, it's very easy for this piece to quickly become sort of all over the place. So I'm uh, for, the, for this class, I'm going to be playing around that tempo, dotted quarter equals 57. I think sometimes, you know, I'm not perfect. I think sometimes I might cheat all the way up to about 60, um, but it's going to be in that range, definitely slower than what's marked, okay? So my first rule for stickings, and I'm going to send everyone who attended this class a PDF of this information afterwards about how I choose my stickings. Um, so everyone will get that for free, my PDF about stickings, okay? So what I do is um, I, start, I start all my phrases with my dominant hand. So whether you're left-handed or right-handed, one of those should feel like your dominant hand. So for me, that's my dominant hand, my right hand. So just de facto, I'm going to start this with my right hand. Then, based on that rhythm, since this is the theme of De La Clouse 9, that's the theme, right? So we now are going to find every spot within the piece, and we are going to apply that same sticking, if at all possible. That's my first two rules of choosing stickings, is that you, you match your stickings from one sticking to another, and you start with your dominant hand, okay? Now, my third rule of sticking is, is that um, if I can, I actually play everything with my dominant hand. So for example, on a Bartok Concerto for Orchestra or something like this. I play that all with my right hand because I want the consistency. Um, and no matter what we do, no matter how, how perfect your sticks are, uh, no matter how perfectly you tuned your drum, no matter, no matter what, there's always going to be just a little bit of wibble wobble between your right and left hand. It's, it's impossible to avoid it. Um, and it, it, it should be as little as possible. I mean, it should be so small that someone out listening in the hall would never know. But just for the sake of consistency, and especially if I'm, if I'm changing environments, my drum just traveled across the country, um, which can often happen, or, you know, like my, the weather's really different and I'm using wood sticks and things just seem potentially just ever so slightly off. It's good to try to play slower rhythms when available with one hand. So what happens though when the rhythm is clearly too fast, like in this opening measure, the rhythm's too fast. You can't play, you know, at, at dotted quarter, again, we chose our tempo, at dotted quarter equals 57, we can't play that with one hand. So now we have some options. We can either play multiple strokes with the same hand, one, two, one, two, one, or double strokes, we could either play double strokes or we could play single strokes. And for me, I choose in this particular etude to play single strokes almost everywhere. Everywhere that I can, I play single strokes. And again, this is for clarity. I have found that playing in a larger space, and often for auditions, you'll play in a nice big larger space, that you want to be as clear as possible. So I'm going to play these as single strokes. 
And again, I'm going to apply that sticking, starting with my right hand, to every spot that I can. So in general, all my 30 second notes are going to be alternating hands, right, left, right, left, right, or left, right, left, right, left, but it's always gonna be alternating stickings, single strokes, okay? So that covers the first measure. All the way up to measure four, right? And at measure four, we now are in uh, some new music. We've, we've introduced the theme in the first three bars. We wanna make sure that that tempo is really steady. We're subdividing the whole time. And, okay? And again, we're already starting. I'm showing you some of the vocalization that I do when I practice. I, I will often count every eighth note. One, two, three, four, five, six, 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 and, okay? And that helps to both keep our tempo steady and it also teaches you where every single rhythm lies on your hands rhythmically and with your vocalization. This helps you over time create a very strong internal pulse because I can actually hear that my own voice going through in my head when my mouth is closed and I'm playing this. So using some of these vocalization techniques will be very helpful for you to, to develop your internal pulse. So not only will I do that, but I will also do the big beats. I'll do the dotted quarter. So I'll have one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. And I always say the next downbeat, even if I don't play it or even if it's a rest. I'm always making sure that I release the note so that the end of phrases have just as much attention as the beginning and middle of phrases, all right? So this, this roll in bar four, one, two, we have to make sure that the roll is clean, that it starts at piano, because piano was our opening dynamic, and that it only crescendos up to a little bit less than mezzo forte, because our mezzo forte grace notes in the, or our next mezzo forte roughs in the next measure of measure five are what need to be the arrival of mezzo forte. Excuse me. And so when I'm playing that roll, I've already decided how many strokes are in my roll. So for me, I play right, left, right, left, right, and then, sorry, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, and a left hand. So I play seven strokes that are rolled, and then I release with my left hand. So again, when I'm choosing my sticking, I choose to meter out also the stickings in my rolls. And I will often play those stickings as what I call the skeleton pattern or the bass pattern of the roll. So I will practice this in bar four like that. I will practice just what my hands are doing without the buzz strokes and then add the buzz strokes in. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And that helps to understand, not only in this role, but in all your roles, exactly how, how much space is given to each hand. Because when we do our roles, we know, and I think that you guys can see on this camera a little bit better down here, what we know that there are multiple strokes and that we compress them. But what defines how the role will sound? Well, some of it is how many strokes goes into each bounce, right? Are we going to do five? Are we going to do two? That would be a double stroke roll, right? That's marching band. Or are we going to do, a, what I do is a triple bounce roll, which has that characteristic to it. So in general, for these De La Cluse etudes, when I'm playing a medium dynamic, maybe mezzo piano, all the, way, all the way up to my loud dynamics, I'm playing triple bounce rolls. Sometimes for longer rolls that are very soft, I'll use what I just call my multiple bounce roll, where I'm trying to get as many bounces as possible per hand to keep them smooth. But for these rolls, I use triple bounce rolls and I make sure that they're all metered out. And so that when I'm practicing, it will be the same way every time, okay? So let's keep moving forward because there's a lot to cover. In measure five is our first introduction to some sort of, um, you know, grace note that's like totally, totally in the clear at, a, at this mezzo forte dynamic. So it's a little bit different than our opening grace notes, right? Because our opening grace notes were piano. 
And so with those pianos, grace notes, it's okay if they're a little bit more open because we want to, again, we want to hear the clarity. Um, and just so you know, I think it's obvious, but I choose to do them with a double on my left hand and then a single note for the main note with my right hand. And when we have them in measure five, though, I think at that point, because we're a little bit louder and because we're trying to make a very clear upbeat, they need to be a little bit tighter. So we don't want them to be down strokes and we don't want them to be heavy like this, which I see all the time when people are learning to say to, they go, Wham. that you would place, you would play something like that. If you had a really heavy grace note, like if you're playing some really big Shostakovich that needed maybe some big, you know, notes that that was heavy but these are not these are sort of the opposite they're light and lifted and so we want to crescendo our our hand that's doubling our hand that's doing the grace notes we want to crescendo it by starting initiating this double and then lifting out with our wrist so you get this da 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 and when you add the main note Okay, then you get this da 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 and that creates excitement and it creates an upbeat feeling. Okay, so even within mezzo forte, we can have zoom, 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 and they're very exciting. So the etude now start from here starts to get very exciting. And we can also, in, within those mezzo forte, as I'm saying, make sure you keep them tight enough to where they feel like upbeats. Because even if we do, even if we play them with a crescendo lifted stroke, if they're too open, blah, 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 it's not the right character, okay? That sort of super open grace note might be better for um, a, a more rudimentary style uh, where you're doing some sort of marching band stuff. But for this etude, for classical percussion repertoire, we want to keep these a little bit more tight and exciting, all right? So then moving on from there... We, can ha we have to decide how we're then going to get to forte. I choose to just ever so slightly drop my dynamic back down to like somewhere in between mezzo piano and mezzo forte. Not, not dropping all the way back down to piano like that, but just dropping down a bit to make sure that we clearly show this crescendo. Because a crescendo from mezzo forte to forte can, you know, over the course of a one note, it's a little bit tough sometimes to show that in a big hall. So I want to make sure that that first note is just ever so slightly softer. It gives me some room to move. Again, uh, I now I'm going to meter out my roll. For all eighth note rolls in general, I'm playing three uh, strokes. So da 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 da, like a like a sixteenth note triplet. Okay. So we've dropped back down, and now we need to address this new rhythm that we have. Dun da da! It's like a fanfare type rhythm, and again, it needs to be lifted and exciting. So it's very easy because we just came out of this roll. We're playing a sixteenth note triplet roll bass. It's easy for it to sound rounded and triplety like this. And we don't want that at all. We want the opposite. Okay, we want very fanfare-like rhythm there. And then in this next roll, what I do is I play two sets of four strokes. And then I have a, a small gap to make sure that the space of my roll has been cleared out, that the sound of this loud roll has had some time to go into the hall. And then I play my next strokes again, okay? Because we they don't know the panel at that exact moment might not recognize that that's again the theme. We have it snuck right in there. If we just played the first beat, that's the theme. So we want to make sure that that's extremely clear, okay? Um, so again, starting back from bar six, we'll have this. And on these, on these accented rolls, what I do is I just use a little bit of wrist stroke to pop out an accent and articulate my roll. So my left hand is just playing a very comfortable roll. Even though it says forte, even with an accent, you don't need very much because the initial impact of your dominant hand is going to make the sound very, very big, especially in a larger space. So the, the roll doesn't need to be like this. 
it can be it can be just calm, contained. <laughs> And, the, and you can bring out the accents more that way. Because what's more important is that the listeners are hearing the rhythm. We want to make sure that that's very clear. So we're going to give some space dynamically to those rolls and to those accents. Then moving on into bar seven. For me, that's actually one of the hardest bars in the whole passage, in the whole etude, because you have two sets of 30 second notes at piano. So that's the most strokes at this point that we've had to do. One, two, three, four, and also on our left hand. One, two, three, four. So again, I know I said to do singles, and it, it, when you take that on, it, there is a, you have a commitment, you have a responsibility to really practice your single strokes at that speed. So if you're going to play single strokes, you need to make sure that even during these spots, that you can completely control your 30 second notes. If they feel completely out of control, you have two options. One of them is that you can switch to doubles, in which case I suggest you play the entire A2 doubles to make sure that they're matched, or you need to just go ahead and do some practicing, right? There's no shame in saying, you know what, that's a little bit too fast for me. I need to work on my soft 30 second notes. I mean, it's 8.30 in the morning here. I guess it's 8.50 now and it's, it's not always easy to just wake up and have full control over 30 second notes, right? I mean, even for me right now, after all these years of playing, 18 years in percussion or whatever it's been at this point, um, you know, I, I have to give a lot of effort to make sure that those notes are completely consistent across the board. So make sure that you give the attention of, of practicing that these more difficult rhythms deserve because you're only as good as your least good rhythm, right? You're only as good as, the, as your worst bar, all right? So, but otherwise, that measures pretty straight ahead. Um, as I said before, when, I try, when I'm playing things, I try to keep them on my right hand. The right, 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 because I'm in the flow state. So one of my rules about stickings is that when you're in the flow state, which means that you've been playing a rhythm and the rhythm continues on that same hand. So if I had like that, I would play them all my way with my right hand. I wouldn't play. I wouldn't alternate back and forth because I want to keep the flow state. And even whether, and that happens whether it's on my right or left hand. And I'm in the flow state when I have at least three notes in a row. Okay. So like that right there, I have at least three notes in a row. I'm in the flow state and I, I continue on with my right hand. Again, one, two, three, one. Dugga da dugga da dugga da da. That's how I do this roll. And it, this is a great opportunity to show your dynamic range. So make sure that when you're in this subito piano in bar seven and eight, that you don't crescendo. One of these times I was playing it, my, it came up just slightly. That's no good. It needs to stay down just like that, all right? Then we, we play this piano roll. We come all the way up to forte. We open up the drum. And then we come right back down. And so I end that on my left hand, but I want to start as many of these 30 second notes as I can back with my right hand. So I play left, right, 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 okay? And the reason that I do that, have them all on my right and not alternate, I don't want to alternate because if you broke it down and you just saw which hand was playing, uh, which individual hand was playing, you want to have that happen. You want to have a very smooth, even decrescendo happening with one hand. It'll really help to, to help the listener hear. You want to have that happen where everything just fades away there. So again, this roll. Okay, comes out and you play it all right hand lead leading down. Theme again, same sticking. On that roll, I don't have, because it's much softer, I don't need to push as hard. So instead of doing nine strokes there, three triplets, I only do eight. The same way that I did on my forte roll before. I use that same idea and just take the accents out. So I do eight. And again, it's really important to vocalize. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, to make sure that those eight notes 
fit in to three eighth notes. It's a little bit tricky, a bit of a kind of a polyrhythm, right? So we want to make sure that we practice that so we feel completely comfortable playing different roll bases in that amount of time. So this is eight strokes, one, two, three, one, and this is nine. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, eight, nine. Eight, okay, so you should feel comfortable doing both and then choose the one that's better for that scenario Okay, so now we have coming out another chance to be in the flow state here I have this right hand lead because that's my rule But I entered the flow state with my left hand on these 16th note triplets into eighth note triplets I actually got this from Ted Atkatz was the first person to teach me this That you can have boom 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 bow Okay? And the reason that I end it on my right hand and not my left is because my right hand has a chance to have a, a, different, a slightly different sounding stroke. So when I send you the PDF, you'll see that at the very bottom, there is, a, there is a caveat that says, if you have an extremely musical reason to break any rule at any time, you should do it to add more music. So I want to have this right hand be a nice big full stroke that starts the new rhythm in bar 12. So again, that full stroke really adds a different sound to me than if I just played this. Da, 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 da. Okay, it would, be, it would sound like I'm still in the flow state and still continuing. By switching to my right hand and playing a slower full stroke, I can, I can emphasize that we've uh, reached an arrival point. And so now I have this arrival at bar 12. And I immediately come, we have arrived and immediately we go right back down to piano, okay? So it's, it's important to show that we have an arrival and that we have an accent on that roll. Dun, da, 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 dun, da. Okay, make sure there's enough space. It's, it's very common to rush that eighth note rest. Okay, it should be very dun, da, 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 dun, ba. Da. Okay, very, very clear with your rhythm there. So now uh, we get into some uh, more challenging material here. Again, make sure that you're dotted. 32nd note there so you're sorry your dotted 16th note into the 32nd note is tight Because we want to show the difference between 30 seconds and triplets And and when we crescendo again, that's a crescendo from piano all the way up to forte We need to make sure we really show the panel that we have a full range here So start very soft and end up at a nice forte and that's a, that's a rhythm that you, you just have to work with the metronome a lot. Okay? With a crescendo. And when you get it, it can sound very, very convincing. You can show them exactly what those rhythms are on the page. You want to make sure that it doesn't blend together, sort of like... You don't want to have like... It needs to be still very clear. And it needs to crescendo. You don't want to accent every rhythm. You don't want to do that, right? You don't want to have every single eighth note shown, but you do want to make sure that the rhythms are shown. So I play my triplet with just a little bit of agogic on the 32nd notes. Okay? I show just ever so slightly to help the listener make sure that they know where we are within that rhythm, within that bar, even within that crescendo. Again, this is not particularly complicated. I play them all right hand. Because when I can, I do, and this is slow enough for me to play that. But we want to make sure that it truly sounds like dun 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 dun, and not um, blah, 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 blah blah blah. So in order to do that, again, we have to make these really tight, these grace notes, and to keep them low. We want to make sure that they're heard. So we don't want to have them so low like this that it, that you don't hear them at all. But they can't be so loud that they sound like a whole new rhythm. That's a different rhythm, right? We want to hear dun 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 dun. So you can practice this by playing them as flams. And then just add in the extra note. 
And here we have what is possibly, in general, <laughs> for what's usually asked, the hardest two bars in classical percussion repertoire for me. I, I think that these are very, two very, very tricky bars that sort of expose the difference between someone who has true control over their rudiments at a so soft dynamic versus someone who can only play this at a forte level, okay? So we have two options coming out of this role. We can either play these doubles on our left hand like this, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, and then we would play doubles to keep the flow state, right? Because we were playing doubles. So we want to keep that flow state going because that's what they've just heard. Dun chicka dun chicka dun chicka 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 dun. Okay. Uh, or we can, um, or we can play them on, with the doubles on our right hand, which would be just the opposite, right? If you choose to play the doubles on your right hand, this is what I suggest. When you reach bar 17, when you reach that uh, the, the beginning of the next bar, play this. Left, right, right, left, right. Left, right, right, left, right. Because that helps get you, in the, in the shortest amount of time possible, back to your right hand or your dominant hand for the flow state of all the rest of those notes. Okay? If you play it the other way, and I've tried both, um, I don't really have one that's my favorite or one that's better. It's just whatever you're more comfortable with. That's on my left hand, and this is on the right. Woo! Obviously, I have a favorite. That one's less good. When you play it on that side, the ending is the same. You just play these as doubles straight doubles in 17. So for me, I like to, as you probably can tell, I like to put the doubles on my right hand and play left, right, right, left, right. Okay. So that's one tricky sticking that can, might, might really help you a lot. I encourage you to try a few different stickings, see which one works best for you. And then whatever it is, really commit to it. Because when that comes up, you're going to want, it's like, even now, you know, after doing this for many years, it, even now when that bar comes up, I'm like, whoa, I got to focus, right? So you want that bar to come up and not be afraid of it. You just want to say, okay, I have a plan. I'm going to execute my plan. I know exactly what I'm going to do. It's going to be this many strokes. For me, it's eight on my left hand. And then I make sure I don't rush this. And I have to make sure I'm very quiet. So probably more than everywhere else, I'm the most zoned in. I'm the most focused for those two bars. Then coming out of that, again, I play this on my right hand with a crescendo. And now we're into very sort of very different music here where we're at forte for quite some time. So uh, there's nothing complicated that we haven't already addressed about bars uh, 18 and 19, nice and tight. Two fanfare rhythms. Da -da, da -da. When you have these rhythms, this triplet in open space, make sure you don't crush it. Okay? Do zump, zump, ba, da da da, mm, mm. Okay? I encourage you to practice that by hitting the rim, by vocalizing. Boom. Bam, bam, bam. And on those, you can play those 30 second notes a little bit tighter to show the, to show the difference between the triplets and the 30 second notes, but you want those to be pretty accurate as well. Sometimes I hear people doing this and they're super tight. They're trying to be maybe a little bit too stylistic. I think it's cool. I know there are some certain schools of thought that have that one particular spot really tight. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's try to try to show that you're from a certain place or that you're doing a certain thing, but I do hear that a lot and it just seems out of place to me. It seems like a um, not just just not necessary. You can have them a little bit tight to show the difference between the triplets and the 30 second notes, but just don't overdo it because you have the same type of 30 second notes coming right after that. And you want them to be matched, right? Okay, so now moving into this, what I do is a, a Swiss Army triplet because in general, one of my sticking rules is that I try to always avoid triple stickings where I can. But in this particular bar, I find it impossible to not have a triple sticking somewhere. You're either going to have, you're either going to have or you're going to have 
You're either going to have two and then a loud or two louds and then a soft, right? So I always choose the one that decrescendos, the, the triple stickings that start loud and then they decrescendo. Back to the AC. I'm getting excited. <laughs> So what I do is that I always, um, like I said, have uh, two, uh, when I'm playing these Swiss triplets, I'll have two notes that are loud because I find that easier to stay at the full dynamic. This, these notes are all at forte. They're not like blah, oh, blah. It's not this. It's not one, two, three. It's the, the middle note needs to be the same dynamic as the first and third, the ones with the, the ones with the grace notes, right? So again, the same thing. And bar 22, you should have those be the same. Okay? So when we're coming down, this is an, a, a, the rhythm is a cello rondoing, and the, <laughs> and the dynamic is decrescendoing, which can be tricky to do, okay? When you have that sort of thing, it's very, very important that you do not rush it. It's, it's easy da, 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 blah, 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 for it to fall away because you're getting softer, it's crushing, and the rhythm's speeding up. So it's very easy to rush and crush, okay? Don't rush and crush. Instead, stay open, stay calm, be 100% literal, okay? And make sure that you're really with the metronome there. Use your vocalization and you'll be successful in that bar. Uh, when I come out of these, I'll, again, I play all these rolls as three strokes. And I just make sure that that release is clear but soft. So I'll often practice rhythms where I go backwards. I'll play that. Okay, and I'll just keep backing up, backing up, backing up. And that can be a good, a good way to practice and also a really good reason to write in your stickings, especially when you first start, so that as you scoot back, you're always knowing which hand you start with. You can see at that, the beginning of that pattern, I actually choose to start on my left hand and I alternate the whole way, again, for a musical reason, because I want to have a very consistent... <laughs> So much, of it is, so much of the rest of the passage is alternated that I want to start the whole thing alternating and have a decrescendo. You just can't get around, oh, I want to start all on my right hand on that particular passage, or I want to start them all on my left hand. You're going to have to switch back and forth almost for sure. Otherwise, you have some really weird and crazy doubles in there that I would suggest you avoid. So... Okay, a nice soft release. Then, surprise! And then another surprise. And then another surprise! And then another surprise. Okay, so this is a, a fun little De La Cluz passage that he writes in here. And it, it, is, um, it is important that it's truly two different dynamic levels and that you're not decrescendoing your role or crescendoing your role. So, dun da da dun da 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 -da -dun 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 -da -da. Okay, they, they happen immediately, and that's the hard thing about this passage is that you have to show those immediate terrace dynamics in real time. So don't feel afraid. Uh, you don't have to 100% connect the roll. It doesn't have to be like you have this m m mystery note that comes out of nowhere because the roll is going to be loud. If you completely connect the roll, you run the risk of not hearing your piano notes. Now on those rolls, I think it's cool to connect them because they are more surprising. So I actually disconnect my loud rolls and connect my soft ones. That is a bit of a strange inconsistency that I choose to do in my playing, but I make it as a conscious choice because I feel like the loud roll actually sounds connected, even though it's not. So I'm not thinking of it as I want, it to, I want the first one to sound disconnected and the second one to sound connected. I'm thinking of it as I want them all to sound connected. And in order to do that, I actually need to disconnect the first one. Otherwise, you won't be able to hear the piano dynamic. So again, something like this. OK, that's how I choose to play that passage. And then again, we are back to our theme, okay? And we start this with our right hand. And when I have this one, I do a bit of a strange thing. Um, some people like to go back and forth when they have rhythms like this. 
But when I have two notes in a row, like an E and, E and, or even if I have da dun da dun da dun da dun, I choose to avoid the flow state on purpose. So this is another one of my sticking rules, is that if you have two notes in a row, and they're the same notes in a row, over and over again, I, pl I play them with the same sticking. I don't go back and forth. I don't go right, left, left, right, left, left. At least in this type of repertoire. If I had a musical reason to do that, again, go for it. But if I don't really have a musical reason to do that, I play them da 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 da. Or um, you'll see later, um, okay, I play them right, left, right, left, right, left. Because I feel like that's more consistent and it has a better chance of the panel hearing those notes as all the same, hearing those notes. In, as, as three iterations of the same rhythm, which is exactly what it is, right? So again, back to bar 27 at the end of that, at the end of that line. And these rolls, I choose to not articulate too much, right? I just want them to sound like ga ga ga, and I want the rhythms to come out. Okay? I do connect them because the, the accents are much louder, so you can connect them. And also, I, I play the rolls down a little bit. So I'm more playing these rolls at mezzo forte. And then I really show the accents. And I make sure that there's a clear difference. Da 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 mmm, da 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 mmm, triple lit mmm, 30 second mmm. Okay? Then here's another one, another fun little spot. I find that usually I would play these on my right hand, right? Dum 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 dum. Okay, just eighth notes. Why would I not play those on my right hand? Well, maybe this is one of my own technical flaws that I just need to work on incredibly hard. But I do find because I'm right-handed, I have just a little bit more control in my right hand, my dominant hand, than in my off hand, my left hand. So. I choose to play what I consider to be the more difficult part of this, the actual doubles of the rough. I choose them to play them with my right hand because it's so soft. And not only am I going to be playing this double P, I'm going to decrescendo. Okay, so I play these double P, a little more open, and then I decrescendo, and then I have to start the roll. And I, and I have to start the roll and uh, you know at like basically triple P, but that's so awesome because it gives me the chance to crescendo the entire dynamic range of the etude, which is that sort of invented triple P all the way up to double F, okay, all the way to fortissimo. So there's nothing too tricky about these grace notes here that are super quiet, but you do need to make sure whatever dynamic you played the opening. People always, you know, uh, sometimes I get the comment from at mock auditions that the piano there could be softer. And maybe that's true if you're cutting the etude in half, right? But if, you're cho if you have to play the whole etude, if you're expecting to play the whole etude for an audition, I would say don't start the very beginning too, too soft because you need to clearly be softer for the pianissimo. So if this is your opening, Make sure that the pianissimo is, is clearly softer, right? It needs to be very clear because it's the only one you get in the whole piece. And again, since it's the only one, you have only one chance to show pianissimo. I'm going, I'm going where I feel the most confident. I'm going with my right hand. I'm putting that right hand in charge, and I'm going to make sure that he plays um, the, the grace notes there. Now this rhythm is a little bit uh, tricky. I find a lot of people crush it or play it too open, but either way it's just not rhythmically right on. So again, you're in the flow state for the beginning. Three right hands, right, left, right, 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 and make it really round. Again, this is not the fanfare, not like this. I hear that a lot. That's not what's happening here. You're already triplety from the very first note. <laughs> then I play right, left, right, left, right, left, like I mentioned before. And I'm thinking of this almost like I played a double, like a Swiss Army. And I just left out the first one. Okay? Okay. 
because I hear a lot. Way too tight or way too open. All right, so it has to be right in the pocket. And the other thing is that the space in between the first half of the bar and the second half of the bar often gets off as well. So make sure dun da dun 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 da dun da dun da dun. Do it in different ways. So in that one, I did three clicks. Dun da dun 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 da dun da dun da dun. That one's two clicks. You can do all six. Dun da dun 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 da dun da dun da dun. Oh, okay. Make sure you you split that bar up into some different patterns to to so that you know exactly where the first and second half of the bar lie. Okay. Now we're right back into some familiar material. Not much to say about it. Make sure those are just rhythmically accurate. Bump, uh, uh, uh. You have one on on the beat, and then two off the beat, and then one back on the beat. And really, they can all be sort of played the same. You don't need to overthink that, but make sure that's where the rhythm is. Doom. It's very common because we're playing roughs for the, the main note rhythm to just go out the window. But don't let that happen. One, two, three. And then make sure that is a very clear full half bar of rest. One, two, three. I always count every single eighth note. I'm always subdividing. So one, two, and three. Two. One, two, three. And of course, I won't say that out loud at the audition, but it's, it's so internalized within me. I've, I've practiced saying it out loud so many times that now I, I can just hear that in my head. Now, on this last spot, here's one tip that I, I feel like a lot of people don't do, and, um, and I'm really happy to share this particular tip. Maybe the most excited for the whole piece. When you are playing, repeated notes like this just da, 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 and you have accents that you need to show the way that you do this is that you set and i think you can see here you set oh maybe this one is better no <laughs> i'll show you like this way you set the stick inside of your finger in just a certain way and just let it sort of wibble wobble with your by using your arm so there's like just there's just ever so much space that you're allowed to use the the stick is loose uh, as loose as it needs to be right the stick is quite loose and i just use my arm there dun 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 so i would call that arm and finger but really what it is is just choosing a position that you have control over where you can let the stick go it's almost like it's go it's hitting the drum and then it's coming back and hitting the bottom of your hand there. So digga 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 like this. Digga 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 digga. And then when you need to play an accent, use your wrist. Okay. So I play. I have my position locked and loaded for my thirty-second notes. And I'm just using a little bit of arm, and in that loaded position with my finger. And then I have my accents come out with my wrist. And that helps those accents to be very, very clear. And I can think about almost only just the accents. Dun, da, 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 dun. Wrist, wrist. Wrist, 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 wrist. Right? They all come out with just my wrist. Sorry. And that way I can also control the crescendo very, very cleanly because I can just lift, I can lift up my arm and I can also very carefully choose the exact amount of crescendo that I want with my wrist strokes. And especially at the very end, we need those last two accents and then into the next measure, we need those to crescendo very clearly. Da -da -dum! That's very, very important that we hear that. Okay, and the other thing about this is that, again, the time can often get really tricky. Recognize that the accents of the triplets, da 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 those happen again. do do da do da do do da and then it's 30 second notes. do do da 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 do da So it should sound very clear. do do da do da do da do do da do da do da right? It's the same accent pattern, but it's just moved slightly. So, uh, or it's not, it's not moved. It's the same accent pattern that's been compressed because of the new faster rhythm that's being used from, from 16th note triplets to 32nd notes.
We have a long roll. In this class, we don't really have enough time to talk about how to execute the best long roll. Maybe we'll get Will James on. He's got a whole book about the concert snare drum roll. Maybe we'll get him to do a class at some point. He can talk to us about rolls. But um, that, that sound needs to, the, the thing you should be going for in your mind, the one tip I'll give you for now is that it needs to sound smooth and lush. It should not sound like, yeah, it should sound like, just like a, like you're in a sci-fi movie. Um, right? Like you're just turning down the filter on your, on your uh, digital audio workstation or something. And then when you achieve that double P, I did lie earlier that I said there's only one double P. There is also this double P in the piece, but it is a roll, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a different ball game here. It's just basically your soft roll. Play the softest roll you can at this spot that's controlled. When you crescendo out of that roll. Um, there's this whole debate about how much to crescendo. I would say just don't go overboard. If you crescendo too much, it's too much of a surprise that you're back to the theme. If you don't crescendo at all, um, then, you, then you've just missed the crescendo. So you don't want to do that. So make sure that you crescendo, but not too much is what I would say. Be smart. Use your head. Don't, that, that's not a good place to go cowboy, right? It's not a good place to say, look at this crescendo I can do. You've shown so many crescendos. Just play a small crescendo, make it clear, and then play piano. If it goes a little bit above piano, it's fine. If it goes to piano, that's fine too. Just make sure it's clear and steady. Swiss Army triplet there. So this whole thing, right, 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 okay? Make sure that those are immediately triplety in feeling. They need to feel very triplety right away. And don't get too loud too soon. This is a long crescendo over two entire bars up to fortissimo, right? We're piano going to fortissimo. So you need to really save your crescendo. We, uh, those, these Swiss triplets, you gotta really practice them to keep them in the, in the piano to mezzo piano range. Now these should, that should be the biggest thing of the whole piece to me, I, I believe. And this last iteration of the theme is like a connected echo or afterthought. Shata! Da 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 da! He could have ended the piece there, right? Da 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 da! And it would have been a cool ending. But it's almost like it's like, remember? You know? Da 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 da! Da 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 da! Okay? So you want to show that both in the way you play it, but probably also in your body language as well. Especially if this is an unscreened audition. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and that, I think that was a little late. I think I need to come down sooner. But it should be connected. Da 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 da! Da 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 da. Okay? It shouldn't be, you know, this sort, of, this sort of thing where it's like an afterthought. It's very much connected. It's like the piece has ended, but you haven't lost it. It's almost, it's almost like when the conductor finishes a major symphony and then he just waits in the silence. It's like the piece is finished, it clearly finished. But somehow it keeps going, like the silence keeps it going. So I would say that happens here in bar 50, the very last bar. It's almost like the silence, right? And, and what I find is that make sure you start that rhythm on time. One, two, right? Sorry. Uh, one, two, three. Make sure you start it right on time. But if it is ever so slightly slower, it's going to be okay. So definitely don't rush it. Like if it was like that, just like a little bit more open, it's going to be acceptable because it's the very last thing you play and it's sort of like, gotcha, you know, like da 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 da, right? If in an ideal world, it's matched. But if you have to be one way or the other, because that's a little bit difficult to get from your loudest thing all the way back down soft again, can be tricky. Make sure that it's not 
crushed. That's the only thing. And guys, <clears throat> that is my De La Cruz 9 class. So what I'm going to do now is just take a really short break because I'm losing my voice a little bit. I'm going to get some water. I'm going to take one minute off. I'm going to play the entire etude. And then I'm going to start the question and answer with you guys, okay? So I'll change the camera up a little bit. I'll change my mic. So just give me one minute, catch some water. I'll play the piece, and then we'll start the Q&A, all right? <clears throat> Thank you guys so much for being here. It's awesome. Even, even an hour into measure by measure class, we have 30 people here. This is amazing. I'm so happy and proud to see where the platform is going. Just awesome. That's a lot of talking. I talk a lot, guy. <clears throat> All right. So, guys, that was the class, and I am going to play this uh, performance, like I said. But it would mean, um, it would really mean the world to me if this class brought you any value for the 30 of you who are here. Um, if you have the capability financially, to make a donation to the conservatory um, to, to sort of pay what you can for this class. That would mean the world to me. It really would because I'm, I'm doing this project as a way to advance percussion education and I want to be bringing more of these classes, both of myself and of lots of other artists that you're going to see. We already have five more classes scheduled, which I'll be announcing soon, um, but I, you know, I can't keep them going forever without your support. So a few of you have already um, sent through some really, really generous donations, and I thank you so much for that, for those of you who have uh, contributed and are supporting the Percussion Conservatory. But please know that 100% of your contribution will be going directly into our Masterclass and Scholarship Fund. So when you donate, that money is not going to me at all, 0%. It's going to do things like pay for our Zoom subscription, pay for our website subscription, pay our artists to give more master classes. Um, I, I, I am not in, I, I'm not in this right now. This, this stage of the company has nothing to do with trying to make money and everything to do with just trying to build this community. And if you guys could be an early supporter of that, it really would make all the difference. And I promise um, that those of you who are supporting early, you know, I've got your emails. There will be lots of lots of offerings that I'll be able to give later on as the platform continues to grow. So um, if, if you do have that capability, please do make a donation. And I'm going to um, I'm going to right now just drop down here in the link. It's W. You, you can make you can make a, a donation really easily. Um, it's www.linktr.ee, like Linktree, with a dot before the E's, and then the PC. And I've just sent it to you guys there, the link. Um, and <clears throat> if, you are able to, if you are able to do that, just thank you so much. And to those of you who have, thank you so much. It really means the world to me. Um, if anyone has ideas about sponsors or you know a sponsor of yours who would like to get involved with the Percussion Conservatory, I'd be happy to hear from them. Please uh, just put me in touch with them via email. You can connect us at hello at the percussionconservatory.com. And uh, yeah, you guys get it. Thank you so, so much for, for your support. And, and if you can't, that's okay. Just go ahead, share. If you can share this video, if you can like it, if you're on Facebook, if you're, when you see our stuff coming through Instagram and Facebook, drop a comment, drop a like, share it around, just show it to people. Just show people what we're doing here with the Percussion Conservatory um, because I, I really believe it's a special thing. I, I strongly, strongly believe in the mission of the company um, and, and the help that we're getting with, from Charlie Rosemarin as our blog editor and from Stephen Keener, who's our events manager. Um, you guys who are early supporters, it really means the world to me and thank you for all your help. So without further ado, here is a full run, full performance, I should say, of De La Clouse 9.
Thank you very much. Guys, thank you so much for being here. If you're watching on the webinar, if you're watching on Facebook, awesome, awesome, awesome to have you here. Um, if you are watching on Facebook, go ahead. You can still register and get into the class. We're going to switch over to the Q&A now. And I'm going to be taking questions from everyone who's here on the webinar only. So it's really good for you to register because that way you can get some one-on-one -on -one direct uh, information from me. You can ask questions to whoever our artist would be. So guys, let's do that. Thank you so much for being here for the class. All right. So let's drop this. Drop the mic. Let's drop the mic down and bring this in for All right. Awesome. And we can go ahead. One second, guys. This was my view. <laughs> if you want to check that out, this is what's going on in the household with me. Um, but I want to go ahead and turn this one off so that we can just focus on the live stream. I'm going to go ahead and try to leave. There we go. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> so guys, for those, oh, you know what? I am so sorry, guys. Just one more second. I need to um, plug in my headphones so that those of you who want to chat, can uh, we can talk. Just one second. All right. I should be able to hear you all now. So guys, thank you so, so much uh, for coming and attending. I would like to let you know from here that you can, you can raise your hand, okay? You can raise your hand, and when you raise your hand, I will be able to actually bring you on to the webinar so that you can um, directly interact with me. So if you want to raise your hand, if you would like to actually ask me a question face-to-face -face in person, then please raise your hand and I'll invite you to be a panelist and we can chat face-to-face. So here are, um, <clears throat> here are some questions that we have, all right? So let me try this button. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can, can see that message or not. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, here's a question that we have. It is, number one, do you practice measure by measure or practice slow to fast run through the piece, all right? So... Um, that's a great question that, um, in general, I do both. <laughs> I do a lot of practicing measure by measure because it's very important that I know what's happening at a microscopic level. I, I need to know exactly what's going on at every single moment. So I'm very particular about each measure. Um, but I do also do plenty of slow practice as a way to increase my focus throughout the whole piece and just to make sure I have the stamina to play the piece and that I get in the mindset of performing. Um, it is very important that you learn to let little things go. I mean, this performance that I just did was absolutely not perfect and definitely not the best run I've ever done, but I was able to I think still execute the piece in a way that was successful for you guys. You know, I think I showed you the things that I wanted to show you. Um, do I, if, if I was preparing this, if, it, if this was audition level ready, right? If it was 100%, like I needed this um, etude, the performance of this etude was deciding whether or not I was going to receive a position with an orchestra, I would make sure that a lot of little things, a lot of little details were more clean. There were some things in there that I would just say were just a little bit sloppy around, you know, a little rough around the edges. So I would make sure that those things are cleaner. And for, to get it to that level of clean and cleanliness, I do a lot of measure by measure work. So that's that. Um, the second question we have is, which tempo do you recommend to start practice from? Um, I wouldn't go any, I never go any slower than half tempo. If you can't play the piece at half tempo, 
no offense, but unless there's like one particular measure that you're like breaking down for some sort of like really intense reason, like the da -ta -da -ta -da -ta -da 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 and you're just trying to figure out a sticking. Of course, sometimes you play things super slow, but if you can't in general play the piece at half tempo, it, the piece might be too difficult for you. So you should probably consider um, just working on a different piece of repertoire until those things are capable, are possible for you, or just go back to practicing a lot of your rudiments. Um, so besides um, besides half tempo, I, I would say that half tempo is probably yeah the slowest I ever go to practice. But in general, I try to just be maybe ten to twenty percent less um, because I do find that when I practice things repeatedly, super slow, over and over and over again. I have a hard time in performance recalling the exact tempo that I want to go. I do want to build a certain amount of muscle memory at my performance tempo. Um, so I try to go full tempo where I can, and that's why I do break it up measure by measure to make sure I can play every single measure at full tempo. Uh, okay, the third question. What snare drum do you use for this etude, especially for an audition? The one I use today is a Pearl Philharmonic four by 14 inch brass drum. Um, I believe that that is the same drum, I think so, that Rob Knopper uses, or maybe he uses an aluminum shell one. And I remember being very inspired by his performance of, performances of these pieces. And he and others have spoken a lot about the benefits of a four by 14 specifically for De La Cluse. But um, I definitely wouldn't go any smaller than that. But I think you can absolutely play this piece on a five inch drum um and i don't really think brass versus wood I, I, they sound different but i think both are very appropriate for um for this class uh, for, <laughs> for this class for this um etude for for de la Cluse in general so either four inch or five inch drum um uh, and and metal or wood is both fine okay so then we have here Another question, which is, good morning, sir. May I know, how do you choose your snare drum sticks? In addition, how does a high school student start in etude like De Clus, and what do you suggest? Okay, so choosing your snare drum sticks is very uh, personal. Um, these ones that I have here are uh, Tom Freer sticks, the medium orchestral, um, if you guys can see that. So there's some free advertising for you there, Mr. Freer. Um, I, uh, I enjoy these sticks a lot. I am, I am not one of his artists. I am not endorsed by his company. I just really enjoy the sticks. I feel like they're very well balanced. So I think when you're choosing snare drum sticks, you want to make sure that the pitch is really even between the two. So I will literally like bonk, bonk. And for me, they're both like la, la. They're both the same pitch. That's very good. You need to make sure that your sticks are the same pitch. And you want to make sure that they... They just that they feel good to you. Um, these particular sticks I find feel good to me for De La Clouse because the beads are a little bit small. And so um, they are very articulate, and but they still have a good roll sound. So like for me, they're a good sort of nimble, swift type of stick that I can use for something like De La Clouse. When I play, um, when I play on my five inch drum, when I play on a five inch drum and I'm playing something like Shostakovich, I would definitely use a different stick, um, especially if I'm in the orchestra, if I'm not at an audition, if I'm in the orchestra and I've only been playing that repertoire all week and I feel very comfortable with the idea of like switching my stick, um, then I might use a heavier stick. I might use something a little bit thicker with a bigger bead, um, but these are a very good general purpose stick. They're a bit expensive, but I think it's worth it. Um, some other ones that I have used in the past, uh, I, I have enjoyed using the Cooperman sticks, but sometimes they can be, a, the shaft can be a bit long. So you have to be comfortable with using a, a stick that's a little bit longer. Um, uh, you know, there, I mean, there's so many sticks. We could talk about sticks all day, but I think the important thing is that they feel good to you and that the pitch is matched. Those are probably the two most important things. Now, your other question, how do you start, uh, how does a high school stu student start an etude like De La Cluse? Um, I think you need to start with a metronome <laughs> for sure. I think the thing that you start with is making sure that you fully understand all the rhythms. So start with the rhythms, go through every single measure, very slowly and make sure that you understand the rhythms. If there's a question about a rhythm, 
ask someone, ask your teacher, you know, ask, find a, find a recording of the performance that you, from someone that you feel like is really well respected and listen to it and make sure that they are, you know, that your rhythms match with theirs. Um, and it, it, especially if, if, um, if you've never seen the rhythms like you see here in Data Close before, it might be very challenging, right? It's very, some of them are very complicated, they're very complex. So it's important that you, um, that you pay attention to that first. And the second most important thing is dynamics. So if, you, if you're playing the right rhythms and the right dynamics, <laughs> you're like 95% of the way there because De La Cluse, that's really, they're etudes, right? They're, they're exercises to get you better at playing snare drum. And so the most important things by far are rhythms and dynamics. So focus on those two things and just take everything else and don't worry about it too much. Don't worry about the tempo too much. Don't worry about, um, don't worry about the, uh, the, the feel, when people talk about feel, like making sure it feels like it's in 6-8 or 9-8 or 4-4, four, four, those things are also important. But if you can't play the rhythms and dynamics, there's no way that you have the feel. So um, make sure that you are paying a lot of attention to those things. All right, next question is, thank you. Ah, oh, this is a very nice compliment. It says, amazing input. Thank you very much. Do you recommend practicing this etude at dotted equals 69? I find some measures are almost impossible to play clearly. For examples, measure 21, 22, and 33. So um, I don't think, I think it's good to practice in general things a little bit faster. Um, actually, one of my old piano teachers taught me this way back in the day. Um, this must be 15 years ago that she taught me this. And somehow I've always held on to it, which is that she, she told me that when you're nervous, even if you've tried, let's say your tempo is dotted quarter equals 60, and you practice dotted quarter note equals 60, dotted quarter note equals 60, dotted quarter note equals 60, you're always practicing it, you're nailing it, sounds great, perfect, you love it, everyone loves it, your teacher loves it, all, every mock audition you play, everyone loves it, right? Then you go to play it for the audition, and you're a little bit nervous, and you recorded your audition, because you're smart, and you listen back to it, and you were playing dotted quarter note equals 63, okay? That is now a problem because you've never practiced a dotted quarter note equals 63. And so you're going to make a bunch of mistakes, basically. So I do practice, to answer your question, I do practice things faster than I would um, that I'm aiming for the performance so that I know what it feels like to be faster, right on target, or a little bit slower than my target tempo. And um, I, I wouldn't say that 69 is necessary. I agree it is a bit of a... Uh, an amazingly fast tempo, but it, I wouldn't say that they are impossible, but maybe your question is well worded. You said impossible to play clearly, and I think definitely in a big reverberant hall, in a, in a concert theater, right? That's very true. You would, I would never play this at dotted 69 in, in a concert hall. It just won't work. And, and what I said at the beginning of the class is that I would choose to play maybe around anywhere from dotted 57 to 61. So I, I, from 57 to 61 is my tempo that I would choose for this. Um, okay, next question. When you're doing a forte roll to a piano subito, do you end the roll before to get to the piano subito? So, okay, we're talking about the clarity of a release note here. And to answer your question, um, it's, it's a little bit, not, <laughs> the question's a little bit not specific enough, um, but because there are some circumstances where I might do that, I guess, but in general, I don't. In general, if I, am, if I have a loud roll, what I will do is I'll connect the roll, but I might play the piano note like ever so slightly louder, or I'll, or I'll move my stick bead to a slightly different spot in the drum just to make sure that the release note is extremely clear. What you want to avoid is and then no release. You want and so I, I think of it like that. It's like and then you have a whisper just okay. So you have to find a way to make that to make that little tap happen. Um, but I think if you go 
that that's cheating <laughs> like and you know again it's music all music is subjective but if this is an etude and you're at an audition and you're trying to show people what you're capable of on snare drum it's far more impressive to connect it and have a very clear little whispered piano note um, so I hope that answers your question on that. Now, we have a couple things here in the chat as well. Guys, it's easier, um, if you can, to use the question and answer button to ask your questions instead of the, um, instead of the chat. But I do have these questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll answer them here. Did you ever practice this on a pad? If yes, how did you deal with the pad to drum difference? Um, yes, I do practice this on a pad, but as much as I can, I practice it on the drum. In general with snare drum, I try to practice on the drum all the time because it does feel different. And I also, not only that, but I always tune my drum. I always check the tuning of my drum before I start playing because even the difference between like when my drum is tuned to an A, like la, you know, when it's tuned to an A, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have perfect pitch, but La, when it's my, when I have that A and it's here, maybe this is an A. La, um, when I have that pitch, it feels a certain tightness. Okay, there's a certain um, feeling of the the how tight the head is pulled, and so especially for things at softer dynamics that are really tricky, like the dun tigga dun tigga dun tigga 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 dun ta 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 completely different on a drum pad than it is on the drum itself. So for sure, you want to practice on the drum as much as you can. If you're worried about um, like wearing out your drum head, one thing you can do is that you can, you can have a performance side of your drum head and then a practice side of your drum head. So you can, you can just basically turn your snare drum around and play on it backwards. Um, and practice a lot of like the medium loud stuff there and and all, and all your soft stuff and then you have sort of a performance side but you're always playing on the drum and in general the drum itself is always going to feel way closer to the real thing than a pad and there are some pads out there that really do an amazing job of recreating the snare drum feel but i do find that um there's just no replacement for actually playing on the drum. So set up your drum, get on the drum. Um, if the noise is an issue, uh, make friends with your neighbors. Knock on a lot of doors and just say, I'm really sorry. I'm pursuing a career in percussion. I'm a percussionist. It would mean so much to me if you would allow me to practice. I know that it's very, very loud, so I'm going to turn off my snares to make it softer. And I'm going to also mute half my drum to make that softer as well. Um, but I need to practice this snare drum. <laughs> and so, and, and you practice at certain hours of the day, right? You practice um, only when people are awake and you, you ask your neighbors and you make sure everything's okay. I mean, I have neighbors, I live in a condo and I was just playing snare drum. So I might get some knocks on my door and people are like, what are you doing? It's 8.30 in the morning, you're playing snare drum. And I'm just gonna say, listen, I'm so sorry. I'm currently in lockdown. This is my profession. I do this to make a living. Let's talk about it. Like, what can I do to help you out? So if there's an issue, if, there, if that's part of the issue, you can talk that out. Um, but just try to get on the drum. Do whatever you can to get on the real instruments all the time. I mean, I don't think a violinist would ever play necessarily on their violin practice pad, right? They might use a mute, right, to play softer, but they're always still playing on their violin. So I would encourage you to play on your drum, use a mute, ask your neighbors to be your friend and support you, okay? Now, the next question is, I have heard some individuals talk about phrasing in the first line and recap of the opening material in this etude. What are your thoughts on phrasing in this piece as well as in other De La Cluse etudes and snare drum etudes in general? Thank you for a great presentation. First of all, Thank you for saying thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed the presentation. Um, I, uh, I totally understand the question and it is a very valid way to play this. What, uh, what the question is asking is sort of, how about playing it in a six, eight feel? So one, two, three, one, two, three. So, so, yeah. Okay. And so this is a little bit playing on the idea that this is like, um, maybe like from Capriccio Espanol. Right. So I think that it's playing on that. And I think that that's a valid way to play it. Again, the, the thing that I said at the beginning of the class is I want this, 
uh, the way I'm performing this for, for the masses, if I, if I have to please everyone, as many people as possible, I choose to play it very quiet and straight because it's an etude and I'm trying to show everyone that I have complete control over my mallets, or sorry, my sticks, my, like the drum, my dynamic level, the rhythm. And so if I can play, and then I can play it exactly the same way, and then again, to me, that's more impressive, even though it's, yes, you're right, technically a little bit less musical. I think it's more impressive technically to show them that you have control. And there's a lot of opportunity in the rest of the etude to show your musicality, to show the phrasing, to show your ability to crescendo and decrescendo, to show your ability to do great roughs and drags and flams and rolls, I mean, everything, right? This etude has basically everything except for four stroke roughs. So, um, you know, between if you play Kiji and you play this, it's like, okay, that's the entire snare drum rep nearly, right? There's, <laughs> there's only a few more specialty techniques that you need to get through everything. So I just wanna show the, the people I'm playing for that I have control, that I know what I'm doing and that I can play anything. I can play this a million times in a row. Yeah, I'm never gonna miss it. Look at that, you know? And you can see from the way I played it. I mean, I'm I'm always totally transparent and honest. Every single one of my was not the same, right? It wasn't perfect and even. There was some variation between them. I tried my best, you know, I, I think it was pretty good. I think it's close. But if I was really making sure that this was ready for an audition, I would have to go, I would have to practice three times as much as I did. And I would need to make sure and I would be so focused, you know, and I would make sure that I warmed up for my full two hours before, uh, you know, like a big warm up and, and showing that. So I know that's a bit of a long answer to your question, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with showing the phrasing if you want to. Just my personal taste is that it's more impressive to play them all flat because I think it's more, uh, I, I think it's just it shows off another level of technical ability. That's all. Um, <clears throat> here's another question. If I were to play dotted 69, how can I execute the syncopated rhythms? I need my music for this one. How can I play the syncopated rhythms with extreme accuracy, such as measure 33? Any recommendations on how you approach this very quick syncopated rhythm? All right, let's take a look at it. Measure 33, well, measure 33. I think you just gotta... <laughs> <laughs> no offense, man. I think you just got to practice that one. That one's not particularly, that shouldn't be too, too hard to play. I don't think speed is the issue with that. Um, again, it's just what you're saying is like c convincing a panel of people that you nailed that rhythm. I mean, that just goes, bam, ba -dun, dun, dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. they barely even had time to read the music, you know? So unless you're a percussionist who already knows this etude very, very well, you're never gonna have enough time to, to process what's going on if you play this at dotted equals 69. If you're at dotted 57, at least they're gonna be like, wow, that felt very triplety. That was all very triplety. I think that was correct. And then the dynamic shift was very, very good and it went to 30 second notes, right? So I think you, sometimes we get in, as percussionists, we get in our head a little bit too much about having everything sound a certain way when really the panel of people is like if a trumpet player or a violinist is listening to this for the very first time they're they're just going to be like toot 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 you know this like they're going to be keeping along they're going to be following along they're going to be wanting to make sure that things feel triplety things feel like 30 seconds they want to make sure things sound matched they want to make sure your dynamics are the right dynamics and besides that they're probably not going to be listening for these tiny little minutia of details of every single little thing. For those sorts of things, you're trying to convince the percussionists on the panel who know this etude extremely well, right? For those guys, um, of, of course, they're gonna be able to hear it at dotted equals 69 and process it because we've heard it so many times, so we already know what's coming. But even for them, if you play it too fast, they're just gonna be like, do I really want this guy as my colleague? He sounds a bit, like rushed. He sounds like the type of person who's gonna show up for rehearsal two minutes before rehearsal and then get all his stuff organized as quickly as he possibly can and get ready for the show and da, da, da. It's like, you're, when you're trying to become someone's colleague, you just want to show them, okay, I'm always gonna be here. I'm gonna be relaxed. I'm gonna be confident. I'm gonna be comfortable. I'm gonna be professional. 
I've learned everything that I need to learn. I'm going to be respectful of the dynamics. I'm going to show respect to the music, to the composer. I'm going to show respect to the conductor. So if the panel asks you to do something a different way, you need to make the difference, right? And so you have, I think it shows more to, to play this at a slightly slower tempo. Um, I, I, think you're, I think you're showing, you have a better chance of convincing someone that you would be a professional colleague with them in the orchestra if you choose to play this at a, at a tempo that is, allows everyone on, on the committee, regardless if they're a percussionist or not, it allows everyone to listen and to understand. So it gets more people involved. It's more, you draw more people in. Okay, so in terms of specifically bar 33, I mean, you could practice, there's a couple different ways you could do it. You could play it with one hand and play double strokes. You could do that because maybe that's easier. Like I was saying with the Swiss triplet, da dun da dun da dun da dun. Oh, sorry, I'm shaking my camera. Dun da dun 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 da dun da dun da dun. Okay, and then, um, <clears throat> and then you can, um, you know, come come back down for the pianissimo, or sorry, sorry for the subito piano. You can come down with your other hand, that the one that wasn't doing doubles, right? Um, that's possible. So okay, let's let's keep moving on the question. Sorry, I'm long answers. I give long answers. Um, thank you for this class and thank you for answering. You're very welcome, sir. Um, follow up on that drum tuning. The Philharmonics come with a suggested tuning. How did you find your own tuning for the snare? It may be suggest suggestive as well, um, but to just know your, I think you mean subjective. It may be subjective as well, but just to know your thoughts and recommendation. Um, <clears throat> suggested tuning you, to, to be honest i don't think i can give a good answer to this question because i'm not i've never heard of the suggested tunings um maybe this is something that's on pearl's like website and they say you should try to tune it to this um sound um, but in general with with my smaller drums four inch drums i tend to find that tuning them at like a, a perfect fourth can sound good, <laughs> but every it's really difficult to answer because every drum is different. So what I would recommend you do, and when I say a perfect fourth, what I mean is you tune the top head and the bottom head a perfect fourth apart, right? Um, and, <clears throat> and there's so much literature out there and other people talking about snare drum tuning. I do not consider myself to be like, the authority on snare drum tuning. Um, I have what works for me. I have, you know, when I'm when I'm at auditions, in, in general, I I don't run into something where I'm being told that my snare drum sounds mushy or unclear. If you're getting comments that your drum sounds unclear or muddy or I couldn't hear that or what was that? If you have that sort of thing, you might wanna go back to the drawing board and look at the tuning of your drum and also the tuning of the snares on the drum and the muffling. Um, the reason that I have this set up was like very specific to this class. So I want my drum, like I had my drum much more muffled for this class than I usually would just because it helps to have, the, to have it sound more clear on the microphone. So the way that I have it muffled for this class would be different than I would play for in the orchestra. If I was playing something like this in the orchestra, I'd have a lot less muffling because I want the bright sound to pop out more because the bright, high cutting sound has a better chance to be clear in a concert hall than it does uh, you know, in this room where the bright, clear cutting sound is going to maybe overpower the mic. And I just want to get a little bit more snare sound. So I'm going to cover up the head a little bit more, get a little bit more snare, put the microphone a little bit far away so you guys can still hear my voice. Um, so these, these are very, as you're saying, it's all very subjective. But I would say even more than being subjective, it's specific to the, the environment. It's specific to each performance. So you might have a different, I mean, especially if you're playing on a calf head, you have a different tuning basically for every time you play, every time you go out and play, you have to crank your drum up and you have to check your snares. So I'm always checking snares. Um, I'm always checking the tuning of the drum, the, the tuning of the top head, the tuning of the bottom head, and making sure I'm finding what works for that space. Now, what's difficult is when you go to an audition and you don't really get to test your drum in the hall before you go. So what you need to do is you need to take your drum to the, the most similar sounding place you can. If you have access to a different concert hall, take your drum to that concert hall. If you have access to a big boomy room anywhere, a cafeteria at your school or um, 
you know, if there's a theater at your school or you have a local community amphitheater, even take it, take your drum outside, you know, t take your drum into as many places as you can and find the tunings that work in all of those different places and then write it down what's working for those places and have someone out, you know, sorry, 40 or 50 feet away listening and telling you what sounds good. Um, and if you don't have someone who can come with you, set up a recorder far away, even if it's just on your phone, and see what, see what works from far away in the hall to sound clear. And then write down that tuning and compare it to as many other locations as you can that sound you know, different but boomy. And then choose the, choose the tunings that you're finding to be the most consistent to sound good that way. And then tune your drum exactly like that to those pitches and to those. Um, it's a little bit difficult to show you, but like on my snares, on, um, on, the dr on actual like the, the little, I don't know what you call this, the tuning, the tuning gauge of each snare, um, I have it marked like a little line to show myself like it needs to go right there. It needs to go right there to there. And so I just draw a little Sharpie marker, um, permanent marker on each tuning uh, apparatus so that I, I know exactly where to tune each snare even. And that's very, very helpful in me feeling confident because I know when I walk on a hall, even if I've never been there before, my drum's gonna sound pretty close to good. It might not sound perfect for that hall, but it's gonna sound pretty close. Um, so that is my talk about tuning. Um, and I think my Zoom, <laughs> this is a great question. I think my Zoom got cut accidentally. I hope my follow-up question got through. I hope that was your follow-up question that I just answered because those were from the same person. Um, so if so, then guys, then that is all the question and answer. If anyone has any more questions or would like to jump on the stream with me, you can please, there, there's a button like right here. I don't know if you just saw that you can um, raise your hand. You can, you can message me, guys, if anyone's trying to raise their hand. If anyone would like to come on the stream and ask a question, you're welcome to do so. Or if you wanna pop one more thing into the question and answer, I can answer another question. But if not, um, then we're gonna be wrapping up for the day. Any more questions, guys? It was a really fun class. Thank you guys so much for being here. It looks like that might be it. So. Guys, thank you so, so, so much for being here. Again, I'll say it just one more time. If it's possible, if it's possible for you to make any sort of donation, please do so. It just means it, it, it makes all the difference. If you guys donate, then we can keep bringing the classes. And if no one's interested, then it, we might, you know, they might not be forever, right? We might do 10 and then they're gonna go away. So if we, can, if we can generate some amount of donations going on so we can keep these classes going, that would be incredible. And I will look for a lot of creative ways to raise funding for this as well um, and so that we can keep the Percussion Conservatory going strong and we will be growing. We have, we have everything set in place to have an amazing uh, rest of 2021 and into 2022. We're gonna have a lot of classes. So please go follow us on Instagram if you're not already doing so, like our Facebook page, share this webinar with everyone that you see. It's gonna be on our website, it's gonna be recorded. So please um, share it around if you can't donate. That would also make a huge help because it just helps spread the info, it helps spread the good word of what we are doing with percussion education here at the conservatory. So guys, thank you so much and I will see you at the next one. Have a great day, everybody, and take care. Whether it's evening or morning, I really appreciate you being here. So have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.